Um, I'm going to be loud anyways, but for the recording, so we have, you guys can watch this later or, or force your friends to watch this. So hello, so now we are going to start. So finally, if you're coming in at the end, now you don't get a seat. You have to sit back, sit back there by yourself. My name is Ryan. Let's see if my clicker works. It does. Awesome. Hello. Um, hold on a second. That doesn't look right. There we go. Welcome to New Orleans. This is probably my favorite city in the U.S., uh, Austin is like my second favorite, so like DrupalCon has been doing really well, kind of just forcing me to go to these amazing U.S. cities, so i uh, really excited to be here. Um, the quick part, I get to talk about me. I come from the Symphony World, which is, this is my fourth DrupalCon uh, coming from the Symphony World, so if anybody is benefiting more from like the Symphony Drupal marriage like, than me, I, I haven't met them. Like I get to come to this conference, it's like probably my favorite conference to talk at actually because of you guys, and this is, uh, sounds like something that everybody says, um, but really the people at DrupalCon have just a different energy level and curiosity than other conferences, so very happy to be here. Um, my day job, I'm a writer for campuniversity.com. We do PHP symphony and screencasts and puns um, and coding challenges. How many people have heard of us before? That's not bad, okay, yeah, that's not bad. Like I always say, that's like 40% of the room, 30% of the room, so like not, not doing that bad of a job at marketing, but not doing that great of a job. So check us out after this. I'll have a couple links at the end. Um, and most importantly, there she is, Wade, there she is. I am the husband of the much more talented Leanna Pelham, who's the true creator of the puns. You can see it because on her name card it says that's her job at Camp University, pun creator. Um, oh, let's see here. What can we do with Leanna? Um, well, let's go with the classic thing. Leanna, she loves high fives. So if you want to get a good look at her back there, she's definitely looking for some high fives. No, it's not her. They look kind of alike. It's the one in green back there. She likes high fives. So if you can give her high five afterwards, you'll basically be her best friend. She's super friendly, way more friendly than I am. Um, or you can, you can tweet at her um, and harass her through this. That would be cool too. All right, so let's get into the stuff we actually want to get into. So the fundamentals of ev every framework ever, except for Drupal. But not anymore, yay! So a big thing with the Drupal, the new Drupal thing is, is, is um, you know, Drupal's taking a step towards what everybody else is doing, uh, which, is, which has a lot of benefits. That's part of what this presentation is about. You guys are going to accidentally, even if you don't care about Symfony, just by doing Drupal stuff and getting better at Drupal 8, you're going to accidentally unlock a whole other set of tools. So let's look at Drupal 7. How many people, uh, you guys remember this? Hook menu, right? Cool, and there's laughing, but the new system ain't so far off from this. It will look different, but fundamentally, it's the same. Um, I'm not even gonna explain it, you guys know the menu. So, let's talk about um, how, because this would be a, a very simple way to create a custom page in Drupal. So, how would you create a custom page in Symfony? Um, well, the key things we're gonna talk about are routes and controllers, requests and responses, and service container. Let's talk about those all in a second. But the most important thing is everything I'm going to talk about, because I'm gonna show you things in Symfony, and I'm also gonna show you things in Silex, which is a micro framework you'll see in a second. Everything we're gonna talk about is gonna be the same in Drupal. In fact, most of the slides you could copy and paste into a Drupal module, and they would just work. I mean, that's amazing. This is why I get to talk at a Drupal conference, because there's so much that's shared between the two. So this is Silex. How many people have uh, heard of Silex before? It's pretty good. How many people have used Silex? Decent bit. Okay, yeah, a few less hands. So Silex is a micro framework, so the entire application is right here. So we have six lines of code, literally one file. You spin up a web server, point it at this file, and you're good to go. So an entire application that says hello, and we're gonna walk through the, the parts of this, because as simple as it seems, this embodies basically 50% of the, the kind of new stuff that came in under the hood uh, with Symfony. So Silex, the reason I talk about Silex, I realize this is important, is uh, Silex is also built on the Symfony components. So Drupal is built on the Symfony components. This little guy here is built on those same components. So they're all um, not cousins of each other, more like siblings of each other. So if we are gonna write this, we literally open up a file, we write this, uh, of course you have to grab Silex via Composer, but you know, assuming you have that in this directory as well. You start up this file, then we need to point a web server at it. Uh, I'm lazy, so I never do that anymore. I use the built-in web server. How many people have used the built-in PHP web server at this point? That's, that's getting to be more and more hands, so 
For those of you that haven't, it's not something that you have to use. I do a lot of training, so it's like the trainer's best friend ever because I, I don't have to debug people's Apache virtual hosts anymore. Um, thank God. So basically, you can just pop into any directory on your machine in uh, command line, just run PHP dash capital S, localhost colon 8000, and boom, you're serving at localhost colon 8000, uh, everything from that directory. So um, I actually use this for most of my projects. If you have, if you need to set up SSL, custom subdomains, stuff like that, you're going to need a real uh, web browser. But this works pretty darn well. Uh, don't use it on production, though, just by the way. <laughs> like, he told me to, it worked pretty well. No, it's, it's, it's very, very slow by production standards. It's fine for development. Cool, so then that's it. So oh, I guess localhost colon 8000. Pretend that's like 8001. I just realized my next slide says localhost colon 8001. Oh, there it is, because up there, yep. So I started at PHP dash capital S, localhost colon 8001, and uh, that's it. Then I go to slash hello slash Drupal dash people, and it's, it screams at me down here. Um, so cool. So here are the, the fundamental pieces that we need to talk about. So a request comes in that says, I want slash hello slash Drupal. That's the URL. Then the routing layer, its job is to determine, uh, actually, that's not, let me say that a different way. Well, that's actually true. I'll, I'll, when we, I'll break this down by piece in a second. The job of the routing is to figure out which function should be called for that page. So if you think of hook menu, it's kind of that first part where you're kind of defining what the URL looks like. That's basically the route. Now, the route is going to point to a controller in the same way that hook menu pointed to a function. A controller is just a function that builds the page. Controller is an overloaded word. It's a function that builds the page. That's it. So the route's going to point to the controller. The controller is going to be what we write to build the page. And that's it. So it's really, if you think of like hook menu being these two pieces, you're like, yeah, that's, that's the same thing. We're just, we're just naming it different now. So that's easy. And then our only job in the controller is to return a response object. So Symfony comes with a response class. You're going to create a new response object, throw some content into it, and that's what you'll return from your controller. So looking at that really, really simple Silex app, Let's break down the pieces. So first of all, this is obviously the route. So the route is basically just the URL pattern. And in Symfony, Drupal, Silex, you know, it's all the same. When you have a curly brace, anything curly brace, that's just a wild card. So you'll kind of see that in a lot of different frameworks and things. So that's what it looks like inside of Symfony. So this matches slash hello slash anything. Now. The controller, so if the URI matches this route, if the URL that's coming in matches this route, then Silex executes this anonymous function. That's the controller. So route points to the controller. Very simple. And as an added benefit, any of your curly brace things are passed as arguments to your controller function. And that's done by the name of it. So the fact that there's curly brace name points to dollar sign name. If that was curly brace foo, it would be dollar sign foo. So it's just done by matching on name. And then we write the controller, and we build the page. And that's it. So again, request comes in, matches the route. Route points to a controller. Controller is a function that we build, that we write, that builds the page. Cool. So that was easy. So let's see how that looks inside of Symfony. So Symfony is a little bit bigger, but it's going to have the same fundamental philosophy. Oh, Drush, Drupal console. So I scream those because uh, Symfony has something just like Drush or Drupal console. I know that that's a hot topic right there, like frenemies, Drush and Drupal console. Uh, we only have one of them, so, so life is good on our side. And actually, our, our uh, version of this is, is actually just an installer. So when you go to install Symfony, you will actually install something like Drush or Drupal console. It's a global executable. Uh, but actually, its only job is to just help you download Symfony. Not that downloading Symfony is hard, but we found out that if we give people an installer, then after they download it, we can give them this really great message about how great they're doing and like what to do next and like very encouraging messages and we color everything with green font and, uh, and it helps them get along to that next step. So this is just a glorified downloader. So you'll see this when you install Symfony. And this is the green text I was talking about, successfully installed with a check mark. Um, so you just say Symfony new and then you give it a directory name. It literally is just downloading a Symfony project into that directory name. So you guys are all very familiar with that because that's the same way basically you get Drupal. You maybe get it with uh, Drupal console or you just download it and unzip it in a directory. So same thing here. And this is what it looks like. And the cool thing about a, a, a Symfony project is there's not much in it. Very few files. 
Uh, I think if you commit a stock symphony project, it's somewhere, like counting fave icon and all that, it's somewhere around 30 files or so. So it's very, very small. So the one kind of key difference between uh, the Drupal structure for things and the Symphony structure for things is in Drupal, you always create a custom module and you put everything inside of that module. Maybe you have many modules. Symphony also has this idea. It's, it's almost the same exact thing. They're called bundles. That you can see this app bundle there. And when you're creating a contrib bundle, it's very, very similar. Like you put everything inside of this bundle and then you share it with all of your friends. However, when you're writing code that goes in your application, we actually purposefully break from this model, and you actually put the code for your application kind of like right, more, more right at the root of your project. So you'll kind of notice that difference. But it ends up being simple because you have an app directory, which contains configuration templates, or said better, PHP classes go in the SRC directory, everything else goes into the app directory. So if I tell you to like, make a YAML file, you're going to be like, that's somewhere in the app directory that I need to do that. So this is what I want you to think about um, when you're kind of thinking about the structure. App and source, they can, are going to contain 99% of your code. Uh, we also have a var directory. That's cache logs, stuff like that. So right, that'd be like site slash default slash files or whatever. You know, it's just stuff that you don't have to worry about that's being cached inside of there. Vendor third-party code. That's just like Drupal 8.1. There's that vendor directory, so that's no different. And the web directory is actually the document root, so that's like one small difference. Instead of the root of our project being the document root, it's that web directory. So you point your web server right there. Cool. Drupal console. Uh, Symphony console. That's right. I was like, why was I screaming Drupal console at this point? Symphony console. So I mentioned that we have that Symphony installer, which just downloads Symphony, and that's all it does. But once you get into a Symphony project, we actually ship with uh, basically the, the, our version of the console that does everything else. So the global one just downloads it, but as soon as you move into that directory, you have a bin slash console file. It's actually physically a file. There's a bin directory with a file called console in it. It's executable. It's just a PHP file. And you can use that to run stuff. So just kind of think that's going to be kind of running Drupal console or Drush and giving you a list of commands that you can run in your project in this directory. And one of them is server colon run. Uh, again, Drupal console has something just like that. It's called uh, Drupal space server. And it's just a shortcut to spin up that built-in web server. Not that that was hard, but it does it for you. And it's smart enough to know that in Symfony, the web directory is your document root, so it kind of you know, points your web server at that directory. But you could have done it yourself. And then, wow, there it is. So that's it. So we just started up our built-in web server. I go to localhost colon 8000, and boom, we have a brand new Symfony project. And again, we try to give you something that feels very encouraging so that you want to continue on to the next step. Um, isn't so much of kind of open source. It's like it's marketing, right? Developer marketing. Feels good. Uh, again, theme. We're keeping a consistent theme with the green checkbox. If you see a green checkbox, it means you're probably making progress. This is a good thing. Uh, you're seeing this actually because, because remember, like Symfony is going to follow that same route controller model. You actually, in your project, this project's basically empty to start with. But we do actually give you one route and one controller that renders this page. So this is actually coming from a real route and controller in your system. And check this guy out down here. I'm going to talk more about this later. This is Symfony's web debug toolbar. This is like super killer, awesome feature. Um, it contains a bunch of debug information I'll talk about later. The most important thing to know about now is we redesigned it to be very black and flat and cool and hipster. So if you need to make like a hipster-based argument to management to use Symfony, um, this, is, this is where you want to go for it. It looks very, very cool down here, okay? All right, okay, cool. So we are at the home page right now, localhost colon 8000, because that's where that one route points to. So if I go to any other URL, like slash nothing to see here, then you're going to get this page, because there's no route for that page. So that's what you see here. No route found for, you know, slash nothing to see here, which is basically Symphony's way of saying, hey, I'm the Symphony Pac-Man ghost, and they, you know, things are okay, but there is no route here yet, okay? Or if you install a certain bundle called the Jolly Code GIF Exception Bundle, you will see one of various random GIFs explaining the situation uh, in a more, uh, more visual way. Cool, so we've installed Symfony, uh, which is kind of basically one command, so that's cool. So let's get to the important stuff of building a page. So we know we need two pieces. We need a route and we need a controller, okay? So routing is done. Well, everything in Symfony can be done in like 500 different formats. 
Um, Symphony is like so flexible. You might, you know, that's you can you can do anything, even kind of hurt yourself potentially. But anyways, usually it's done in a YAML file, although that's a lie, and I'll tell you why I'm lying in a second. But just you know, kind of eat my lie for now. Say so, yeah, okay, everything's done in a YAML file. So typically routing's done in a YAML file. And oh, oh, and, and so where does that YAML file live? Well, it's not a PHP class, right? So it probably lives somewhere in the app directory. So it actually lives in app slash config slash routing.yml. So remember, there's two pieces to the route. First, we have to define the URL. So there's our slash hello slash curly brace name. And the second thing we need to do, just like hook menu, is we need to point to the function, the controller that's going to build the page. By the way, this hello underscore world here, that's a machine name for the route. Um, it's not important now. It will become important later if you want to like refer to this page, refer to this route, link to this route, something like that. Um, so there's our path. And the way that you point to the controller, which is the exact same inside of Drupal, is by doing this underscore controller thing. Now, obviously, this is not the real value. The value looks like this. I just ran out of room on that line, um, you know, because there's not that many characters on a slide. So the difference between, um, well, let me say it this way. In Silex, right, our controller was actually an anonymous function. In Symfony, it can be anything, but it's typically a method inside of a class. It's the same thing in Drupal. It could be anything. Symfony really doesn't care. You just got to give it something it can call, and it's like, far out, I'll call that function. As long as it returns a response, I'm happy. But it's usually a function inside of a class. We have not created this class yet, um, but I'm using namespaces here, obviously another kind of new concept. Um, but here's my long class name, and then it's just colon, colon, and then the method name we're going to have inside of that. So cool. So let's create that. So let's see, that's a PHP class. So that lives in the SRC directory. And in fact, this could live, this controller class could live anywhere in the SRC directory. It's typically an app bundle slash controller, um, but you can put it anywhere. The only rule, and this is true with Drupal as well, is that your namespace matches your directory structure. So the fact that I have namespace app bundle slash controller means I need to be in the app bundle slash controller directory. If I change that namespace, I could move it into the corresponding directory. And, and update the routing file, and life would be good. Okay, and that's the same thing in your custom Drupal 8 modules. There's a slight twist to that rule, but it's the same thing. There's an SRC directory in your modules, and then you're going to have to move things around just based on what namespace you're giving it. Um, and you can give, usually you can give things whatever namespace you want. Usually there's some standards you'll follow so that you don't create the most horrific Frankenstein project ever, but technically speaking, it usually doesn't matter where you put things. So cool, so we have a class here. Here's our function, say hello action. I'm passing uh, the curly brace name, so we're doing the dollar sign name thing here. And as I said, our only job in the controller is to return a symphony response object. So this is the use statement for the response object. And I mean, response objects are easy. Responses are nothing more than content, headers, status code. So response, I give it content. It defaults to 200, and it has a couple of really basic headers by default. So that's it. So it's the same exact model, just done in a class. And we can pull it up that way. Cool? So again, request routing controller response. Across now we're across Drupal, Silex, and Symphony, which is pretty cool, because those are three very different beasts. But they all have the same fundamental philosophy. So debugging, so let's see here. Uh, if I handed you a big Symphony project or a big Drupal project, you might be like, uh, what pages do I have? Or you might go to a certain URL and be like, I need to change this. Like, where's the code for this page kind of thing? So it would be nice if we could get a list of all of the routes in the system. Well, you're going to go back to that bin console. And this is actually similar. People that are using a Drupal console, Drupal console has a lot of the same commands as Symfony's bin console. Um, they're kind of based off of each other. So if you're on bin console debug colon router, you're going to get a list of every single route in the system. All these routes up here on top are things that help along that web debug toolbar at the bottom. They're not there in production, by the way, but that, that's what those are. But here's our guy right down here. Hello underscore world, machine name, and there's our URL. So this is a really, really good way to figure out like what the heck is going on. What did I just inherit that I need to figure out how things are working? Also, let's go back to this uh, very hipster, cool looking guy here. Um, if you hover over these, then you get more information. And this is probably the most useful one because this is actually telling you what controller was called and also what route was matched. That's the machine name. I, this has got a slightly different machine name than because I'm mixing up some screenshots here. <clears throat> also, there's a ton of other information. This is actually, I'm covering it here, 87 milliseconds is the response time. Um, this is actually telling me who's authenticated. 
this is another thing that tells me how what templates rendered and things like that. Now, this is cool, but if you click any of these links, like click any of these things down here, you go into something else called the profiler. So basically this explodes into about 100 times more information. And you have all kinds of different sections along the left here. So Doctrine is the library in Symfony that people usually use to make database queries. So I'm not making any queries on this page, but if I were, I could click the Doctrine thing here and it would show me every single query that was being made in my system. You can even run and explain right there on those queries and figure out, you know, get do the MySQL explain. Um, security, uh, events, ooh, events, whoa. We're gonna talk about events. Um, logs, let's see here, uh, forms, exception, all kinds of stuff. Um, the most important one, probably the most interesting one, oh, actually this is kind of interesting. The Twig one actually shows you like all the Twig templates that went into building your page and how long they took to render. So that's kind of cool. The most important one is the performance tab. And it looks, well, I can only fit part of it on the screen, like this. This is actually meant for profiling your application because it shows how long every little bit of P and piece took along the way between the very beginning of the request to the end of the response. However, it's even more interesting as just a debugging thing. Like figuring out like what the heck is going on? What's the magic that I can't see? Because the only thing that we do as developers is we make a route and we make a controller. But there's something that happens before and after that route is matched. There's something that happens before and after that controller is called. And I don't know what those things are. This shows you what those things are. And by and large, these are listeners, which you can think of as basically things that are implementing hooks. Um, and we're gonna talk about those in a second. But this is going to be a way we can actually see like what's all the hidden magic behind the scenes. So you can see a bunch of stuff here. And oh, yeah, I ran out of space here. But actually, about right here, you'd actually see a little bar that said controller. That would actually be where our controller is called. And then there would be a whole bunch more stuff down here. All right, good. So can we do even less work? So I, I lied to you earlier. Um, it's not a surprise, because I told you I was lying to you about the YAML thing in Symfony. Typically, in Symfony, we do our routing with annotations, um, which is not done in Drupal. However, annotations are something, I'm sure you guys have all seen annotations, already worked with annotations. Annotations are something that you see in Drupal 8 quite a bit, just not exactly for routing. So now, when you create a page in Symfony with annotation routes, you only touch this one file. So, hey, I want to create a new page. I would say, great, go to, con go to a controller class, create one if you need one, or reuse an existing one and just create one function and put the annotations above it. The route and the controller are, are right in the same spot. These are obviously PHP comments, uh, but it's just a way of configuration. So instead of having my configuration in the YAML file, I've moved it over to my class. And I have had people that absolutely love that. I've had people that have told me to get out when I told them that. Uh, annotations are a very, uh, very polarizing thing. I like it because, um, because of the context of having these things right next to each other. So you don't have to like wonder what, what's the URL to this function, because it's, it's right there. But ultimately, you have that um, router debug, the debug router bin console thing. So um, you've got lots of ways to figure out like what, uh, what the URL is to a controller anyways. All right, so the first half of this whole thing is all about routes and controllers. So cool, so we got that. So 50% of the new stuff is it's done. We got it. We're putting that away. So the whole second half of Symphony and, well, Symfony and all the new stuff that comes into Symfony or Drupal from Symfony is all about services and the container, the container. Dramatic, dun, dun, dun. All right, so first, services are useful objects. Okay, so that's another like overloaded word like controller. It's like, hey, uh, you should turn that into a service. And you're like, yeah, totally. You're like Googling what is a service. And they're like, a service, a service-oriented economy is one where people work jobs, and you're like, damn it, damn it, such a generic word. <laughs> Services are useful objects. Uh, now, I gave a workshop yesterday, and I realized when I said that, um, that it sounds a little weird, because you're like, wait, what are unuseful objects then? What's not a service? So you can totally mess this up, but in a fairly classic object-oriented model, you have two types of classes. You have some classes that just basically do work, so you can think of like a, a, an, an object that does translation. It just does work. You call a method, you give it like some key, it gives you back like the Spanish translation. It does work. Those types of classes don't typically hold data. They don't typically hold a lot of state, if you want to use that somewhat uh, trendy word in programming. 
So you don't like set properties on it usually and have it hold data for you. It just does work for you. The second half, the other half of objects are ones that don't do work. They just hold data. They're just kind of like dumb model objects. Sometimes they're called data transfer objects in other languages. Um, so um, yeah, so usually they have like, you, they're, they're holding data. I think I, I, the thing I gave yesterday that I wasn't sure if it was right or not because like I don't know that much about actually using Drupal day to day, but nobody like shouted at me. Um, there's a couple of people that are in my training right now. That I'm, this is probably wrong and they're probably being like, God, no, we are nice, but don't, don't say that again. I was thinking like the node object is something that primarily holds data, but doesn't do a lot of work. Accurate? Yeah. Now you see, you can start to cross the line here because you can actually take a nice little model object, something that just says, by the way, the model objects can do basic work. The classic example I give is if you have a user class and it has a first name and a last name property, you can put a function on there called get full name that has a you know, first name, last name with a space in the middle. So it will do some work, but it's all just kind of like minor work related to the data of that object. Now you can take that user class, and you can start tacking on other methods on it, like send emails to all users, and that's you actually starting to mix these two ideas. So if, you know, when you get into more object-oriented architecting thing, if you just remember the rule of make a class either do work and not hold data, or make a class hold data but do not do work, you're probably going to accidentally end up with a pretty nice architecture. So just kind of keep that in mind. So anyways, the services are the objects that do work for you. They're your workhorses. Now in Symfony and Drupal, pretty much everything is done by services. Pretty much all the work. If something's being done, it's probably being done by a service. Um, and so there's a lot of these service objects floating around. There's a, a service object for like logging and for translating and for Twig. Um, so we have to kind of keep track of these. So this is where the idea of a container comes in, which I know is another like major buzzword when you start getting into this stuff. So a container is basically just an associative array of all of those service objects because they're all flying around out there. So let's see if we can hone them in a little bit and actually put them in one spot so we can kind of keep track of them. Now it's an associative array, so that means that every one of those has a nickname or a machine name. So if you want to get out to the if you want to get the, the, the logger object, you might read some documentation and say the nickname or machine name for that is logger or is logger.factory, which I think is the one that it is in Drupal. So you just got to figure out like what the nickname is to the object you want and you can just go and get it. So cool. Now, that, so this is another lie, small lie. Um, it's not actually, the container itself isn't actually an object, so this is actually the more accurate slide. It is in fact, or it's not an array, it is an object, but the only method on it is git. The only method that we care about at least. Git, you give it the machine name, it gives you the object back. So think of it like an associative array of service objects. Great. So as I mentioned, there's a lot of services in Drupal and Symfony that are put into this container out of the box. These are tools. A service is a tool. This is a good thing. And uh, if I give you guys the container, then you're dangerous because you just got you can just grab stuff out of it. You can do anything inside of Symfony or Drupal because you have everything at your disposal. So the question is, actually, here we go. Um, the question I'm going to ask in a second. So actually, in Symfony, the container is actually loaded with 220 built-in objects. And Symfony doesn't give you a lot of stuff out of the box. We ran this yesterday in my training, and it was 560 or something like that for Drupal. So there's a ton of useful objects that are sitting in that container. Um, by the way, if you run debug container without piping into word count dash L, you're actually going to see a giant list of every single service in the container. So that's a very, very powerful idea of the service container. Because in more in Drupal 7, it was more about just like knowing function names. Like if I want to get something done, I just call a function name. Um, and that was, that was cool and that was easy. But there's some real power here to basically being able to list out every single tool you have. There's no way to kind of list out all of the useful functions you had before. So this is really, really powerful. And when you install new modules, they will give you more services. So when you install a contrib module, you will all of a sudden have five or 10 new services in this list, new tools at your disposal. And if you want to, you can actually grab one of the, those, uh, you can run that same command and actually pass in a specific machine name like Twig, and it's gonna give you more information about it. Very critically, it's gonna give you the class name. So in lieu of documentation, you could actually look through the container for a service that you needed and then actually look at its class name and just kind of figure out what methods you want to call on it just by knowing its class name. All right, so now we really want the container, right? Because we're like, cool, I'm really dangerous if I can get the container. So how do we get the container inside of a controller? This is slightly different in Drupal 8. This is probably the slide that's the most different between Symfony and Drupal 8. The way you get access to the container is a little bit different in Drupal 8 in your controller. 
but it's just a small thing. It's not like a big philosophical difference, just uh, kind of a word of warning. So in Symfony, we just give it to you. We're like, here you go, boom. Uh, you just get it in your controller on a container property. Boom, present, early Christmas present. So you can just say this error, container error, get, fetch out the service you want, and then just start using it. How do we know that Twig has a render method? Well, either you're fancy and you look at that class that is associated with that service, or you're probably reading some documentation because you're reading about how, I, how do I render templates. You know, the most important thing is when they tell you, when you Google for how do I render templates and they tell you to get the Twig service, you guys need to understand the whole idea of a service container. Oh, I'm just getting out a useful object. Its machine name is Twig. That's what the most important thing to understand. Uh, and here I'm running a Twig template in Symfony, and this is actually what it looks like if you're curious. So um, Twig is, is pretty much the same uh, between Twig and Drupal, except for in Symfony, we're actually responsible for building our entire page. So we'll actually extend a base layout where we actually define the HTML, where that's done with themes in Drupal. So here's our same model here, but I'm going to tack on an extra thing. There's a container full of useful objects, and it's accessible in the controller, and we can use that to get our work done. Because remember, the only rule in a controller is you need to return a response object, but now you have this big bag of objects to help you. They're optional objects, so nobody's forcing you ever to use something out of the container. You guys can get your work done in the controller however you want to. If you want to make a curl request out to a big Java app and just get the HTML that way and return it in a response object, that's cool. That's up to you. So you can use those objects or you can not use those objects. It's like sometimes people, especially in the Symfony world, forget that. They like, they're like try to force everything through a tool um, when sometimes it's just a really simple problem. They could have just solved it easily themselves. So what else does Symfony do? That's a bad question. Symfony doesn't do anything. Symfony's boring, snooze. Symfony doesn't do anything. The services in Symfony's container do things. There's literally nothing that Symfony does that is not actually done by one of its, the services inside of its container. So just a couple of quick examples. If you're uh, using a database in Symfony, you're probably using a library called Doctrine. And that's something that we actually kind of give you a service in the container to query the database. So the code here is not important except for that first step, which is I go out and grab a service of a certain machine name, and then I can start using it. Uh, if you want to use like the PDO directly, or there's actually this uh, library around it called Dball, Doctrine Dball. But anyways, there's a service, and you can just go out and fetch that service and start making queries. So we're just using our tools. There's also a form system. So Symphony has this big form component. Guess what? The form component, which is actually quite complex in Symphony, uh, all boils down to a single service. So in reality, if you wanted to like use the form system and do all kinds of fancy things, form.factory, that's what you go through. Always comes back to services. So anyways, this is not really important for this, but this is how you build a form in Symfony, and that's how you render a form in Symfony. Uh, different than Drupal 8. Drupal 8's uh, form system is different. Um, or you can just, uh, by the way, as far as forms go, you can just do it yourself. So one thing to remember also is like there is a request and a response object in Symfony and Drupal. It's the same object. And if you want to, you can always just go grab Symfony's request object and just grab uh, information off of it, headers, query parameters, post parameters. This is actually kind of funny. Request error request. Who's, whose idiot idea was that, right? Uh, technically, I had to look this up because I was like, this is so silly. Uh, there's got to be a reason behind this. Technically, in the HTTP spec, post parameters are called request parameters. So this is like one of those times where like this is correct, even though it's weird for us to look at. So there you go. So later, like six months from now, when you need to get post parameters, and you're like, what the heck? Uh, you can remember, you know, this is correct, even though it's weird. Um, and there's tons, tons more community bundles out there, just like contrib modules. Um, and again, when you install it, the, the number one reason that you install a contrib module is because it gives you more services. Okay? They also can do other stuff in your system. And that's the same thing with bundles in Symfony. I install a bundle by and large because it adds more tools to my container. It might also add more routes and controllers. It might also add some translations and things like that. But the fundamental thing is it adds more services to my container. And if there is one container. I got that question yesterday. Great container. There's a one container for your entire application. It's not like every module has their own container or something like that. So um, we're using things out of the service container. We also need to, well, we also are going to want to eventually create our own services and put those in the container. And this is critically important. So here's, here's our setup here. We are now going to uh, select a random greeting, okay? And we're going to pretend like this is a big, long, ugly chunk of code, like 100 lines of code. And 
And we're trying to decide if we want to just hack this in our controller or if there's a better way to organize our code. So we say, you know what, I don't want to hack this inside of my controller because um, we actually maybe want to reuse this somewhere else. Maybe you want to unit test it. You know, we just, you just know that kind of moving it into its own function is a better idea. So back in the olden days, we may have just created a new flat function and thrown the 50 lines of codes in there. Now, it's kind of a theme, right? I'll say, we may be used to just use a flat function. Now we're going to put a method inside of a class. That's going to happen a lot when you're kind of transitioning. We're still going to isolate this 100 lines of ugly code to a function. It's just going to live inside of a class. So here is our, um, here's our class here. It's a random greeter. And uh, selects from uh, one of these here. And uh, we call public function randomly greet, give it the name, and it hooks us up with the a nice cute message. All right, awesome. So this has nothing to do with Symfony or Drupal. This is just just being like, hey, this is a pretty cool class we just made here, and we're all feeling good. So, all right. So how do we use this in our controller? Well, this step so far has nothing to do with Symfony or Drupal either. It's just object-oriented coding. Notice I did not make this static. There's a good reason for that. So far, I could have made this a static function, but I didn't. And you won't make very many static things inside of Drupal or Symfony. So since that's not a static method, it means I need an instance of that object. OK, so that's no problem. I'm just going to, in my controller, instantiate a new random greeter. And, uh, and then I'm going to call the method randomly greet on that. And it gives me back my greeting. And I pass that into a template. So cool. So this is just, um, just, just object-oriented code organization kind of stuff. Great. So um, could we log something? Could we log in our controller which greeting was used? OK. Well, first thing is, you're going to be asking, is the system I'm using, Symfony or Drupal, do they already have a logging functionality? Well, both of them do, so then it's a matter of what is the service uh, machine name that I need for that. And in this case, I can actually, um, well, you can actually guess it a lot of times, but you'd probably actually Google, how do I log in Symfony? And they'd say, it's the logger service. So this is the logger service. Uh, it's telling us what the class name is. So awesome. So um, remember, we're, we have access to the container inside of our controller, so we can just say, this arrow container, arrow get logger, and then we just call a method on it, which again, you'd look at the documentation or open up that class and say, what methods are inside of this? Great. There's a method called info, and that's it. So when you're working the controller, this is how you're going to do most things. You're going to just say, I'm just going to go out and get that service and start using it and feel really good about myself. So this is where the curveball comes in. Uh, could we log from inside of our random greeter inside of our controller? So the most logical step is we're going to take this code here, we're going to Copy that, paste it in the other guy, and see what breaks. Or it doesn't break, but it'll break. So here we go. Yeah, awesome. We're feeling good. We run that. Um, probably half of you are already thinking why this isn't going to work. There is no property called container in this class. This class does not extend anything. Drupal doesn't really care about this class. This is not a class that Symfony cares about. This is just a class we created. There is no container property, so that ain't going to work. The whole thing where you get a uh, container property magically only applies to the controller. The controller is this like special first entry point of your application. So Symfony gives you the entire container because it's like you're probably going to need this, buddy. Good luck out there. Okay, so it just kind of passes that to you. But it doesn't happen anywhere else. So uh, oh my God, dependency injection. So this is a term that's uh, like you guys are hearing a lot. Have probably been hearing for a long time. There was a presentation early on earlier on dependency injection. It's the easiest idea ever uh, with the hardest name ever, um, and also it's like the most confusing easy idea ever. Uh, I can't decide if it's easy or hard basically. But we're going to show a quick example of this. So the scenario is this: I'm in. I am inside a service. By the way, this is a service. We have not put this in the container yet, but this is a service. It's a class that does work for us. So whenever you find yourself in a service and you don't have access to something that you want, you're like, ah, I need the logger object or I need an API key. It doesn't have to be an object. Sometimes it could be configuration. You're like, I don't have access to something I want. In olden times, this would have been where you'd use the global keyword. You're like, screw it. I'm going to global database connection and then we're good to go. Or maybe call a static method. Static, when you call static methods, that's actually the same thing. It's actually a way to just kind of reach out of the global scope. We don't do that anymore. There actually is a couple ways to still cheat in Drupal. I'm not going to show them to you, but you can find them. But basically, we don't have access to anything inside of our function. In fact, the only thing we have access to is a name variable. So what we're going to do is we're going to force somebody else to pass it to us. That's what dependency injection is. It says, look, if I need something, I need the logger. So I'm going to create a construct function. I'm going to put logger as an argument, and I'm going to put it up on a logger property. 
Now, this does not fix our problem. It just basically screws over whoever is instantiating us because now it's their problem to pass us the logger objects. It's not like this magically works, like something like magically like found this and like put it in there. Um, our code's broken at this point. But, oh, and if you want to be super trendy, you can figure out the class name or interface behind that and type hint. Type hinting is optional. If you're new to this stuff, don't worry about type hinting. If you're getting a hang of this stuff, type hinting is totally rad. Uh, it gives you better auto-completion and better PHP errors if you mess stuff up, but it's optional. All right, so and then down here, because we know that we've screwed over the other guy who's got to instantiate us, we know once, if they're able to somehow pass us the logger, we have logger on a property, so down here, we're able to actually use that logger. Okay, so this class is now perfect, but our application is still broken, so we need to go back into our controller, but hey, in our controller, we have access to the logger, so hey, problem solved. When we instantiate the random greeter, we'll just pass the logger in as the first constructor argument, and that is dependency injection. Cool? When we needed a second service, a second object instead of a random greeter, it would just be a second constructor argument and a second property. Okay, cool. Um, okay, now the last thing we're gonna do here is, checking my time because I wanna get through everything. Well, I'm almost through, I promise. I won't, I won't keep you guys forever. And I'm not over time yet, I'm just aware of my time. Um, last thing we're gonna do is actually teach Symfony, teach Symfony's container specifically how to instantiate our services. So as kind of silly as it seems, we are going to literally centralize that three lines of code, or really one line of code. Instead of creating the random greeter, we're going to put that in a central spot so that we can just ask that central spot for the random greeter object, and it will instantiate it for us. There are several advantages to doing this. One of them is that if you have this code in like 10 different places, like 10 different controllers, and then tomorrow you decide to add a second constructor argument to random greeter, you got to go update all those 10 places. Another thing is that if we put this in the container, a property of things in the container is when you ask the container for a service, you say, hey, I want the logger service. If you ask for it 10 times, it always gives you back the same one instance, which usually is what you want because you don't need 10 loggers to log 10 messages. You just need one logger and you call info on it 10 times. So it's kind of a nice way to make sure you don't have extra objects flying around that you didn't need because that's just extra memory you didn't need. Cool, so the way that we teach it is via a YAML file. And it's very simple because to instantiate an object, there's only two pieces of information you need to know. What's its class name and what are its constructor arguments? So there's a services.yml file in Symfony. There's also a services.yml file inside of your Drupal module. It's actually module name.services.yml. Um, but it looks exactly like this. This is copy and pasteable into your module. You'll have a services key. You'll create a machine name, which is whatever you want, because clearly that's a stupid machine name, so that, that could be anything. And then it's just class, it's the full name main space of your class, and then it's an arguments key. Now this is actually, and I realize YAML is still somewhat new to you guys, but what this is actually creating is an indexed array. So this is the first constructor argument. If I had a second constructor argument, it would just be another dash down here, and another dash down here, and another dash down here. There's also a single line version of this you'll see, which is identical, which is square brackets, and then it'll be like at logger, comma, the second, comma, the third. So sometimes in YAML, you can do things in a single line, or you can break it into multiple lines. So they're not doing different things. You'll just see both ways. Now, the key here is if I left off the at here, then it would actually pass the string logger. So there had to be some way when we created Symfony for like, us to kind of indicate we don't want the string logger. We want the service logger. So we just kind of invented the at symbol. So the at symbol is a total kind of special Symfony containerism. It's just used in this spot, and that indicates we need the logger service created. So now we can ask the container for the my random greeter service and it's going to instantiate it for us. And that's very important. We're going to ask for the my random greeter. It is still going to instantiate it. There's still some code that's going to say new random greeter, open parentheses, and then pass in the logger object. That didn't go away. We just centralized it to this kind of invisible layer. So what that means is we can actually run debug container and we're going to see our service inside of there. So we just went up from like 220 to 221 services inside of our container. We added another tool to our container. And now we can use it inside of our controller just like this. Go out and get it. We don't have to instantiate it manually anymore. All right, cool. So last thing real quick, and this is very, very important, especially when you start diving into the magic of, um, of Symfony and Drupal. So the first, the first two parts, the routes and controllers and the containers, those are the two big guys. This is like kind of the third big-ish guy, but less big, I guess. So Drupal has hooks, Symfony has events. And you'll find, just like hook menu, they do the exact same thing, they just have different terminology. The biggest difference between hooks and events are that hooks, you had to name something a specific way, and then it was magically called. With events, you don't have to name your function anyway. You can just name it whatever you want, but there's an extra step 
that says, when this event happens, call this method. So there's a little bit of configuration that does that. So this is back to our same model. When Symfony or Drupal is going through its request response cycle, there's different events that are, it said, the word we use is dispatched. There's different events that are dispatched. These are, just ba these are the same as like if you were using like module handler and actually, um, what's the word, basically firing a specific hook and it would call all the, uh, the functions for that hook. It's the same idea here. So Symfony has an event called kernel.request. That's just what the event is called in the same way that there are hooks that just have names and you need to kind of Google to figure out what those names are. There's one called kernel.request that happens during this part of the process, another event that happens here, and another event that happens here. So when I say event, just think like that's a hook. And if I want to hook in at that point in the request response cycle, then I'm going to add a listener on this specific thing. And the listener is just a function. So let's do something crazy. So what if we didn't return a response from the controller, which is like dun, 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 because so far I've been saying like you always return a response from the controller. You have to return a response from the controller. That's not technically true, and actually in Drupal, you rarely return a response from the controller. You typically return a render array. So we can actually very easily write that same thing in a symphony. It'll actually show you how that works in Drupal. So now I've updated my controller to return an array. I I'm just inventing this array. This is not significant in any way. I'm like, I don't know. Let's create a template key and a variables key. Let's make something else actually render the template somewhere else. So if you do that, you're going to get this terrible error. Uh, the controller must return a response. That's what I was trying to tell you guys. The controller must return a response. Okay, what are you doing? Um, I'm so angry right now, okay? Um, or you'll get this if you have the bundle installed. <laughs> so, okay, so what you're actually gonna do is you actually hook into one of those events. There's one event that happens after the controller if you don't return a response. It's actually called kernel.view. And an event listener looks like this. Again, it's actually a class. It's a class that implements event subscriber interface. I realize that's a little hard to read. And you just need to have two methods on it. This one down here, which basically says, when kernel.view happens, call this method on view, which could have been called anything. So this is going to be called. And obviously, I'm already kind of planning ahead. I know I'm going to need the twig service. So I'm already kind of planning for a dependency injection here. So this is cool. Um, this is looking good already. Step two is you're going to register this as a service. Boom, looks exactly the same way. You still have your other service up here. Now, there has to be some way for us to be like, no, this is not a normal service. This is an event subscriber. We, we need to some way kind of like notify Symfony or Drupal to, to know that this is an event subscriber. Just us having that class there and having it registered as a service is not enough for it to be auto-discovered. So we have to raise our hand and be like, no, 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 my service is special. And you do that with a tag. This is a little bit weird looking, but you're literally, it's like tags isn't like tagging a blog post. You can just add tags to your service. Be like, this service is tagged with delicious. It's the pizza service. Like you can just make up tags if you want to. But when the container finishes being built, there's actually a process that runs that says, please give me all services tagged with kernel.event subscriber. And it gets those services and it kind of notifies Symfony's core that those are event subscribers. So there's a finite number of tags in the system, but typically if you're hooking into some core part of the system, you're going to use a tag. You're gonna create a service, you're gonna Google how do I do X, how do I hook into X process. They're gonna tell you, create a class, make it implement some interface or extend some base class, and that'll be different depending on what you're doing. Register as a service and then tag it with something, something that kind of hooks you into that system. So you're gonna see that process uh, quite commonly inside of uh, Drupal. And this is less important, but this is actually what our function might look like. This is actually goes and gets that array that was returned from the controller and actually passes it to our twig render and then ultimately gets uh, the HTML that came back and puts it into a response object. That's actually how the render array works in Drupal. Obviously, it's much more complicated than that, the implementation of it, but it's a listener on kernel.view and, uh, and it does different things, kind of reads the format you want and, and does various things. All right, cool. So. Um, be nice if, uh, this is what I always think, it'd be nice if I could like, see like, a fully featured Symfony app, I could poke and see how it's doing. All right, rad. So remember that Symfony installer? If you just, instead of saying Symfony new, say Symfony demo, it's gonna download the Symfony demo project, which is something that we maintain, and we try to pack lots of features into it, and it's just a fully featured, kind of best practice nice Symfony app that you guys can hack around with and try to break and unbreak and break and unbreak. So I highly recommend that. Um, and here's what it looks like. It's even styled somewhat nicely because I didn't style it. Actually, I styled the first version of this and somebody came through and fixed it. Um, God bless designers. 
Um, also, uh, when you're using Symfony or Drupal, I highly recommend using PHP Storm. There's a lot of auto completion, like a lot of long use statements and things like that. You're gonna, if you're not super opinionated, if you're willing to try it, you're gonna have a good time if you use um, PHP Storm. There's also an amazing Symfony plugin, which gives you all kinds of crazy auto completion in Symfony and Drupal that we have no business having. And uh, so I highly recommend installing that. If you go to that bit.ly right there, we have a free tutorial on PHP Storm and it'll like, walk you through installing that and lots of other shortcuts. Um, also, Camp University, that's, I'm, I'm biased, but it's the best way to learn Symfony. So come check us out. I'm gonna have a coupon code in a second you guys can look at. And also use Silex, because it's all the same stuff. So if you wanna kind of get into this stuff slowly, use Silex and you're gonna be good to go. And use Drupal 8. Drupal 8 can be used to, to learn Symfony or Silex. So look, it's a big happy family. We should have put like a big heart around it. You know, so um, again, the fact that I can give this presentation is, is a testament to me being a Symfony guy. And I'm actually pretty darn good at Drupal. And uh, if, as you guys get into Drupal, you're going to find that you're pretty darn good at Symfony on accident, which is pretty cool. So principal themes, AKA, uh, I don't remember what the presentation was about, but I keep having these words in my mind when I try to go to bed. Uh, route controller response, services in the container, and event listeners. Those are the three critical things. And Drupal 8 and Symfony share the following things. Request and response objects. Routes, controllers, response, event listener system, services and container system, that's all exactly the same. You can get a list of all the services with Drupal console. You can get a list of all the routes with Drupal console. Ah, oh, man, there's no web debug toolbar in Drupal. Kidding, there is, yay! <laughs> it's in the devel module, it's a sub-module in devel called web profiler. And, and it's pretty, pretty rad. It's been around for a while and uh, it's awesome. It actually has like 10 times more stuff than Symphony's does. So there you go. So you can use Silex to learn Drupal. You can use Silex to learn Symfony. You can use Symfony to learn Drupal. You can use Symfony to make you a sandwich. <laughs> um, and finally, we have more tools to solve more problems. Thank you very much. This, by the way, is a coupon code for a free month on our site. So go grab that. We have uh, a, tr a tutorial similar to this. We have lots of Symfony stuff. We're going to leave that up for like a very short amount of time. So um, you know, create an account and register and use that. Um, there you go. So thank you guys very much.